Okay, you know, in that last video on dipole-dipole interactions, when we compared molecular fluorine with uh, bromine monofluoride, you may have asked yourself, you know, uh, when you think back on molecular fluorine, uh, you may be wondering, well, look, if, if molecular fluorine has no dipole, then how is it able to even condense from a gas into a liquid? Like, why would it, what, what's the attraction, you know? Why would those molecules want to stick together? What's, what's driving the uh, condensation of that kind of a compound? And the answer is uh, in London dispersion forces. So this was a big mystery for a while. Um, many decades ago, and uh, a guy named London, Fritz London, kind of, um, uh, you know, enlightened us on this. So um, perhaps the simplest example of the London dispersion uh, force interaction is between two atoms of helium. So here I've got, I'm trying to depict in a very cartoonish way, um, uh, two atoms of helium. So here's the nucleus uh, with two, you know a positive two charge because of the two protons and then let's represent the electrons with the, the little uh, letters. And um, when, well I should say, w when they're apart, when they are you know relatively isolated, these two electrons in the 1s orbital, um, they are evenly distributed in three-dimensional space, you know, around this sphere. Um, so, uh, a, you know, <clears throat> I guess a concise way to say it is the um, <clears throat> the electrons on uh, on helium are spherically symmetric about the nucleus. All right, so it's just like a, a little ball. However, when you take two atoms and when they approach each other, uh, they begin to sense each other's presence. And <clears throat> one way to conceptualize this particular type of intermolecular force is that first the electron clouds um, you know probably pick up the uh, the biggest uh, interaction and so they obviously electrons repel each other because they have um, the same charge and so let's say the one electron on the first helium kind of uh, you know heads for the hills over to the left and and then that exposes the um, the right hand helium to uh, the nucleus of the first helium. So the electrons on this guy can now um, sort of sense the positive charge coming from the nucleus on the first one. And so they're like, hey, you know, let's, this is really attractive, let's go over and check it out. So, um, so this is a way of reaching a more stable um, configuration you know, among the electrons and the and the uh, and the nuclei, um, and this leads to these really tiny little dipoles, right? Because you know, if, if we kind of step back and look at this a little more broadly, what a dipole represents at the end of the day is a uh, a slight polarization of charge. Okay, and so if the electrons are spending more of their time over here on the left than they do on the right then you've got this little bit of excess of negative charge on the left and then you've got the positive charge over here and that can be represented very concisely with a dipole all right and that's why my dipole is pointing to the left because i'm trying to depict the electrons as uh, being biased toward the left because there's this other big guy over here with his electrons on the left so you've got these two dipoles that um uh, that are kind of attracted to each other now, okay? So it's kind of a two-step. Um, and what happens is, over time, the two atoms, can you see how they're, you know, the electrons are kind of sloshing back and forth? They set up this correlated motion, all right? And as long as they maintain this correlated motion, then the dipoles are always pointing kind of uh, either in the same direction or they'll be you know parallel but the but the important thing to know is that uh, they'll reinforce each other and they they will maintain an attractive force and at very low temperatures when 
the atoms or molecules are moving extremely slowly, they can get close enough for this um, correlated motion to begin. Okay, and we have a name for this. Uh, the official name for this behavior among atoms and molecules is electron correlation. Um, we've talked about the word correlation before, but uh, you know this is another context. Um, so here's what you need to know. So electron correlation, as we just saw, it leads to what we call instantaneous dipoles. And the reason they're not considered permanent dipoles like on bromine monofluoride is because these dipoles only exist when two atoms or two molecules get close enough and then this little two-step this little dance can start so they're called instantaneous dipoles and uh, that is a consequence of electron correlation so like I said uh, if, if the helium atoms move slowly enough this weak attractive force will allow them to condense and that's what allows um, substances like helium to condense uh, at a low enough temperature. Uh, here's another really important thing. London dispersion forces, um, they operate between all molecules and atoms. So anything that has electrons is going to uh, engage in London dispersion forces. Okay, so you may be thinking, oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, how can it be both that and dipole dipole? And well, I'll show you an example uh, a little bit later that um, of molecules that can have you know uh, three um, three of those things going on at the same time. Um, okay, so uh, just to back up, the whole the name of this force is London dispersion force, and it's um, and it's it arises because of electron correlation uh, and and that drives instantaneous dipoles um, okay now let's look at something let's look at another example where London dispersion forces are operating so let's look at two argon atoms now with argon argon has 18 electrons sorry my daughter my daughter's screaming upstairs um, and so when these electrons start sloshing back and forth during electron correlation, it's going to lead to a bigger dipole. They'll be instantaneous dipoles, but uh, they'll be bigger than they are with helium. And so that's going to lead to a larger uh, dispersion force, a larger force of attraction. And so if argon has a larger force of attraction, uh, can you tell me how is that going to affect the boiling point for argon as opposed to helium? You know, which one's going to have a higher boiling point? Well, if there's a stronger force of attraction between argon than there is between helium, then it's going to take a higher temperature to get the argons apart, and therefore you can say that argon definitely has a higher boiling point. Um, in fact, if you look at the series of noble gases, <clears throat> um, as you go down the periodic table, each one has more electrons in its... Um, electron cloud than the one before it and so hopefully you would you know you would expect the London dispersion forces to be getting stronger and stronger and stronger as we go down the periodic table and lo and behold that is absolutely manifested in the boiling points these boiling points are on the Kelvin uh, absolute temperature scale um, and you can see it's a very uh, very nice uh, clear progression um, Here's another context to just kind of help illustrate. So let's say you were comparing two compounds, carbon tetrafluoride and carbon tetrachloride. Now, chlorine and fluorine, those are both halogens, group 7A. Um, chlorine is right below fluorine. And so chlorine is, you know, a bigger atom. It has more electrons. And so when you stick four chlorines on a carbon as opposed to four fluorines, um, the uh, carbon tetrachloride is going to take up, it's going to have a larger surface area. Um, there's a bigger cloud of electrons that might be sloshing back and forth. And so you would expect the London dispersion forces to be stronger in carbon tetrachloride. So let's see, do you think that's going to be reflected in the boiling point? Will it be larger or smaller? 
uh, and hopefully you said larger, and uh, indeed it, it, it is by a lot. Uh, that's, uh, that's Fritz London, by the way. That's the fellow who um, kind of worked out this theory. Um, okay, and that, my friends, is London Dispersion Forces.